Well, thank you. It's a, uh, indeed a pleasure to be here and uh, talk to you about uh, the work we're doing to try and understand the genetic code from a, a number of different approaches, from designing life uh, to trying to uh, recreate it. So first let me mention I represent three different organizations. This is the uh, Venture Institute, again on the UCSD campus. So this is, must, this is the UC San Diego Symposium this morning. Uh, it's the first carbon neutral research building on the planet. It generates all its own uh, energy from uh, sunlight and has a beautiful view uh, of the ocean. Um, we've been trying to understand going from genotype to predicting a phenotype. And a prevailing question is can the genetic code uh, predict your current phenotype and can we predict the future? And also uh, can we rewrite that code which uh, the next speaker will address uh, with the wonderful discovery of uh, CRISPRs. So when we first sequenced genomes, we converted the uh, biological four-digit code into ones and zeros in the computer. And we've been filling those databases uh, ever since uh, uh, sequencing of very large numbers of cDNAs, which led to the first genome in 1995. In fact, Within the first uh, year, we did uh, three genomes, uh, uh, Haemophilus, a small mycoplasm, and then the first archaea uh, with the late uh, Carl Woese. And this allowed the first comparative genomics and created a number of new questions about does DNA contain all this information for cellular life? Uh, these genomes were all very different from each other. And could we come up with a minimal uh, gene set that actually uh, defined life? Uh, and that was a challenge. We decided the only way to do it was to try and synthesize uh, life uh, from uh, basically from scratch uh, from the genetic code. So we decided to start with the ones and zeros in the computer and four bottles of chemicals and recreate uh, the genetic code to see uh, if we could reestablish what we had in the databases. We started with a uh, simple virus, uh, the first DNA virus that was sequenced by Sanger and colleagues, Phyx-174. Uh, it's a little over 5,000 letters of the genetic code. But the DNA synthesizers uh, are error-prone. Uh, it's an N-1 situation. The longer the piece of DNA, the more errors. So we had to develop new approaches for error correction. But we went from uh, the ones and zeros in the computer to chemically making the, this piece of DNA uh, that we injected into E. coli. E. coli immediately recognized this as normal DNA, uh, started reading it, uh, making proteins. The protein self-assembled to make the virus, and after a certain accumulation of viruses, uh, the cells burst open and the virus was able to infect additional cells. So we call this a situation where the software uh, builds its own hardware. We just put in a piece of chemical software, ended up with these viral particles that could then infect other E. coli cells and make uh, uh, millions of, to billions of copies of themselves. Now we wanted to make an entire uh, chromosome for a, a self-replicating cell, but we knew if we could make viral sized pieces accurately, we might be able to accumulate a lot of these uh, link them together uh, in an assembly to get to the chromosome. And that's basically what we did, but it took a lot longer uh, than we thought. Uh, we had to develop all new chemistry tools uh, to be able to write larger and larger pieces of DNA and then to assemble those uh, together. Uh, this accumulated in 2010 with making this 1.1 million base pair uh, genome from Mycoplasma mycoides. It was made by starting with 1,000 base pair pieces, putting 10 of those together to get 10,000 base pairs, putting 10 of those together to get 11, 100,000 base pair pieces, which we simply injected into uh, yeast uh, using the homologous recombination that assembled these into the entire chromosome. Uh, we had to learn how to isolate the bacteria chromosome from a eukaryote. Uh, and then work on how to boot that up. So we had two teams, one the chemistry team and the other the biological team on genome transplantation. 
so the team was uh, Carol Latigue, a French postdoc, and uh, John Glass, who headed the team. Uh, and uh, they probably did thousands and thousands of trial and error experiments uh, because you cannot pipette uh, entire chromosomes without shearing them. We have to isolate them in gel and uh, then uh, do all the chemistry in gels and then transform those into uh, a recipient cell. So we have this uh, very simple movie showing what happens when we put the synthetic bacterial chromosome in a recipient cell, uh, we start, uh, as soon as it enters the cell, we have a cell that's the phenotype and body of one species, and there's two different sets of genetic software. We designed the system, and my colleague in this work, Ham Smith, who is the co-discoverer of restriction enzymes uh, that yield his Nobel Prize in 1978, we designed it so there was an asymmetry. So as soon as uh, some of the proteins started being made, uh, early ones were restriction enzymes that recognized the chromosome in the cell as foreign DNA and chewed it up. So now we have the body of one species and the DNA software of the other. Uh, in a very short time, we had these uh, new uh, cells uh, that are completely self-replicating. And when we interrogated them, uh, every molecule in the cell uh, was uh, based on the new DNA code that we put in. Uh, there wasn't anything left from the original species. Uh, so we call this a situation where, uh, again, the uh, software uh, builds its own hardware. Uh, we had to develop to uh, a new code so that we could mark these cells as synthetic. Uh, we have a code that we can write the entire English language with numbers and punctuation with a new biological code that puts in frequent stop codons. And this code contained uh, the instructions for decoding it, uh, a URL uh, to send an email to it if you were able to decode it, the names of 40 scientists that contributed to the work, the names of the institutions. And then I added three quotations uh, from the literature. Uh, the first one from James Joyce, uh, to live, to err, to fall, uh, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. Uh, the second from Oppenheimer's biography, American Prometheus, uh, that he heard from an early teacher, say things not as they are, but as they might be. And the third, which probably is the most important uh, from Richard Feynman, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. Uh, after this all became uh, public, uh, we received a letter from James Joyce, a state attorney, uh, asking if we had permission to use his quotation uh, in the genome. Uh, in U.S. law, you don't have to uh, worry about permissions for anything uh, less than a paragraph. Uh, and then we started getting emails from a Caltech scientist saying we had misquoted uh, Richard Feynman. And finally, he sent uh, from the Caltech archives a uh, photograph of Feynman's uh, blackboard with the original quotation, uh, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Uh, we think one of his biographers uh, changed that to the quotation you find on the literature. Uh, we've changed the genome uh, now to reflect the new quotation. Uh, and you'll see in a minute why this was uh, so uh, critical. I think all this work proved and helped confirm that life is a DNA software system and that if you change that software, you change the species. Now, mechanisms have developed uh, throughout uh, biology uh, to keep this from happening very often, or you would have a nice sushi dinner and you would start to grow gills because you incorporated uh, the fish DNA into your own. Bacterial cells use restriction enzymes as their protection. Uh, but when there's a mismatch of uh, these enzymes, as you saw, uh, you can add an entire new set of chromosomes to a species, adding millions of new data points in a single uh, event. So our goal was then, after we did this uh, control experiment, to see if we could actually design a new species in the computer. Uh, so we developed computer software to design new biological software. We actually held a contest within both the Inventor Institute and Synthetic Genomics uh, to see who could design a minimal uh, genome uh, 
uh, that would l result in a living cell. And we actually thought this was going to be relatively straightforward because ever since 95, when we uh, published the first two genomes, there's been study after study in the literature listing what people assumed was a minimal gene set for life. Uh, it turns out uh, none of the designs worked. Uh, and to get to this stage, it took us uh, almost four more years uh, of this actual uh, minimal uh, genome. And we had to add back genes uh, until we could get a living cell again. So we had this design, build, a test cycle. And so imagine doing this, we had to resynthesize the genome uh, every time, uh, but our tools kept getting better and better, and we now have robots uh, that automatically uh, build uh, the large pieces of DNA. Uh, we went through multiple uh, major cycles. We, we ended up with uh, our synthetic version 3.0, which has only 473 genes. So it makes it the smallest genome of any self-replicating <laughs> organism uh, thus far known uh, to science. But the most uh, surprising part, uh, we also made a synthetic RNA so it would be identified as a, a unique uh, cell by those who follow uh, 16S RNA. Uh, but the most unique aspect of this new self-replicating cell is that about a third of the genes, 149 genes, were completely of unknown biological function. All we knew is that if we didn't have those genes present, we could not get a living a self-replicating cell. Uh, we assumed maybe 5%, uh, not up to 30%. And if we hadn't followed Feynman's approach of trying uh, to build it, we wouldn't have known that we were missing about a third of essential biology. Now, any cell type, if we start with an archaea, we start with anything else, would have its own unique set of at least 30% of its genes being of new unknown function. Uh, and when we look at these phylogenetically, uh, these unknown uh, functional genes are highly conserved uh, throughout uh, the uh, evolutionary tree. We also decided to uh, reorder the genome because if life's going to be part of a design process, uh, you'd like to have an engineering approach where you had cassettes of the different uh, gene systems. Uh, so we, using another computer term called it uh, defragmentation, where we can reorder these. And just to show you the, how complicated it is, this is just looking at all the rearrangements on uh, resynthesis uh, to get even uh, one-eighth of the genome uh, reordered. I think the most surprising thing is uh, we can do this and uh, results in a living uh, cell without any change in the biological function. So what we see in genomes is the results of billions of years of random events, uh, and we can reorder them and get them in a highly uh, ordered function, which will make the next levels of design uh, uh, much easier. Uh, we can now, uh, we think, recapitulate as uh, scientists in the 17th and 18th century proposed uh, all of biology by adding genes back to this uh, minimal uh, cell. This helps put in context our 22,000 genes in the human genome that we know even less than two-thirds of in terms of any one of the biological functions. Uh, the same techniques that led to the first genome of using computational tools to assemble all these pieces of uh, DNA uh, led to the first uh, human genome in 2000 and this publication in 2001. And a few years later, the first complete genome uh, separated into complete haplotypes of the two uh, parental uh, chromosomes. This first genome cost $100 million and took nine months uh, and was not an event that was going to change the practice of medicine or even our understanding of individual biology. Fortunately, what's happened over the last 15 years is a major change in top technology. Very little change in our understanding of the genome. Uh, because we only had a few genomes uh, to work with. 
but sequencing costs got below $2,000 a genome instead of $100 million. And the, most importantly, computational power has changed substantially. In 1999, uh, we spent $50 million building the third largest civilian computer in the world, which was one and a half teraflops. Uh, many of you know you can buy a card for your PC uh, for about $100 uh, that does a, a teraflop uh, versus computing. And we've gone from uh, major computational centers to distributed computing uh, with cloud computing. The third component uh, that we're waiting for uh, was advances in machine learning because the amount of data we're dealing with uh, is much too vast uh, for mere uh, mortals uh, to try and understand. Uh, so a little over two years ago, we formed uh, Human Longevity. Uh, this is our uh, main building in La Jolla. We also have uh, a site in Mountain View, uh, which is our machine learning team and a site uh, in Singapore. Uh, we started uh, with the Illumin X10 sequencing large numbers of genomes. Uh, a little over 30,000 have been done to date, but uh, that results in close to four petabytes of just A's, G's, and T's in the computer. Uh, to put that in context, uh, just a few years ago, uh, indexing the entire internet was only uh, 12 petabytes. Uh, with our goal of over a million genomes, just the sequence data alone is going to be the largest data set uh, that anybody's uh, compiled. Um, and just, you know, the definition of sequencing uh, genomes uh, is now become a, a sort of like the uh, uh, Republican laws in the U.S. where all data is fungible. Uh, there was a paper recently published in Nature with the title of the sequence of a thousand uh, human genomes. Uh, it turns out they were only done uh, uh, to uh, covering less than 30% of each of the genomes. Uh, at HLI, we sequence genomes to 30x coverage, which is the only way to get statistical coverage of about uh, 10 uh, sequences for every uh, base pair, which gives us highly accurate data uh, and coverage of the genome. Even so, human genomes are still not completely sequenced. Uh, I don't know if you can see these uh, gray areas. That's where there's less sequence coverage. These are around the highly repetitive areas of centromeres and telomeres uh, and other repetitive areas. But in the uh, reproducible uh, a genome, you can see the false positive and false negative rates are extremely low, uh, resulting in extremely uh, accurate data. Now, even before we reached 10,000 genomes, we saturated all the common variants in the entire human population. And this is where if you've got a 23andMe chip or another gene chip of uh, data, they measured just the first couple of bars on the right, the common variants uh, that most of us share. These are not the causes of disease or even any of our uniqueness. Now, if we sequence anybody's genome, we add about 8,000 uh, new, extremely rare variants that only show up uh, at mostly at, at once in our entire database. These are the ones that are highly significant in terms of causes of diseases or other uh, genetic traits. In fact, now we can do calculations that we can only have dreamed of a few years ago, where we can look at billions of data points to understand the structure uh, of the entire human genome. And what we have found is there uh, are invariant uh, portions of the genome that if there's a, a sequence variation at that site, it's incompatible uh, with life. Uh, these are quite often at intron, exon junctions, uh, but a number of other unique places. And even we can take all the transmembrane proteins uh, together uh, and look at their functions, and perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the part of the protein that spans uh, the lipid membrane uh, is uh, not uh, mutable uh, with, uh, con in a way that's compatible uh, with biological function. It's not surprising if you get a charged amino acid there, uh, the protein uh, couldn't stay uh, in the membrane uh, both the intercellular and extracellular part uh, can take 
uh, high levels of mutation. Now, I think one of the most important discoveries the team has made recently is uh, certain mutations and truncations in genes disappear uh, with age. So, in other words, they're incompatible with long life and you don't find them in older populations. This is this, the average curve if you were born in 1900, the, the blue line. Uh, you can see that uh, getting to 50 uh, was a big deal. If you're born in 1950, the yellow line, uh, it's a nice shift. And if you're born as recently as 2010 is the red line. Uh, we're trying to make uh, the shift uh, to at least move this curve out. Um, not necessarily where you fall off a cliff at age uh, 100. We don't know what the true biological limit is as we find these variations. But one of the biggest surprises to me is our genetic code is constantly changing. If you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have said, you get your genome sequence once, and unless you have cancer, that's all you need to worry about. Now we can very accurately estimate your age just from changes in the genetic code. So it's not gonna be simple to solve the aging problem, but these unique gene truncations that only occur as heterozygotes yet result in uh, early death are gonna be an amazing set of new uh, targets. We don't need huge pedigrees and huge populations now to understand disease. We can sequence from a single patient of the genome uh, and understand the changes associated with that disease. This is an unusual disease, Delaman syndrome, that only occurs in thus far about 30 individuals in the entire human population. Uh, if you can see the MRI, the brain is highly scrambled. Uh, it's actually more amazing to me. Uh, this young boy has uh, any appearance of normal function. His body is covered with uh, these small uh, tumors. Uh, we had the ability to get the uh, DNA from his parents as well, so it's called a trio when you have the two parents and the child. And it was very interesting because just looking at the parents' genomes, uh, these uh, solid color areas of black and solid orange is where his two parents had the identical genetic code over these long regions. That tells us immediately that these, uh, the parents are very closely related to each other and a result of a lot of interbreeding. They were, in fact, second cousins, but they're from a small village in Mexico with a lot of inbreeding. Uh, but any geneticist can tell you if you have the identical sequence in both parents, it means extremely rare alleles then get expressed. Uh, looking at the uh, boy's genome, we found a number of unusual uh, genes associated with neuronal development that were, in fact, uh, mutated. Uh, and one very unusual one uh, in combination with that, and that's the neurofibromas fibromatosis 1 gene. Uh, many of you probably know it as the elephant man's gene. Uh, it w was changed as well. But this is where we can now find mechanisms of inheritance, having both parents' genome. It turns out this mutation in the NF1 gene only occurred in the child, which means it was a spontaneous mutation. So you can't rely just on looking at your parents to understand your own genetics. We all get several hundred to several thousand spontaneous mutations uh, that make us totally unique uh, and even different uh, from our parents. But now just from a single case, uh, uh, anybody trying to diagnose uh, uh, Delaman syndrome uh, has the genome uh, for comparison. One of the areas uh, clinically we're finding uh, the most interesting for applying some of these tools is with cancer. At HLI, we have a comprehensive cancer analysis where we sequence the entire genome of the patient, the entire genome to 90X coverage of the tumor. We sequence the RNA in the tumor uh, we uh, isolate T cells from the tumor and sequence the entire T cell population. 
we sequence the viral population, uh, and we also do liquid biopsies looking for circulating DNA, and sometimes we also do uh, the metabolome. Uh, this results in an analysis that gives a, a lot of information. And here's an early case uh, of HPV-16 caused head and neck cancer, uh, which is a new somewhat epidemic uh, in men, usually starting in their 40s and 50s, uh, uh, that it's not clear yet whether the vaccine given to young boys and girls will work as a cancer preventative. Uh, but just on sequencing this man's uh, genome, uh, we found he had several mutated oncogenes, which put him at high risk uh, for cancer. Uh, genes from his immune system that indicated he was probably immune suppressed, which he was. And from his microbiome, we found HPV-16 present. Just that unique combination would probably say this individual would be more when he got cancer, not if he did. On sequencing the genome, we found 25,000 mutations, so doing both the patient's germline and the tumor, you get the mutational burden of the tumor. In this case, 25,000, uh, which is sort of a modest number. Uh, 315 of those mutations changed protein structures. So these, the term for this is neoantigens. We also found four places where the HPV a virus inserted into the genome, disrupting a gene uh, function. So we're able to do a pathway analysis, not only looking at the mutated genes, but looking at other druggable targets in that same uh, pathway. And by sequence, the entire T cell repertoire, we can tell whether the patient had uh, mounted an immune response against any of these neoantigens. Now, this should hopefully make it clear to you, if, if it hasn't been before, why your immune system can detect cancers. The mutations create new proteins that aren't normal human proteins. Your immune system, if it's intact, recognizes these as non-self, uh, and uh, your T cells normally will kill these cells and rid them uh, from your system. We are constantly ridding ourselves of tumor cells. If you go out uh, in the California sun for about an hour, you accumulate about 10,000 mutations in your skin cell a genome. Fortunately, we're constantly replacing our skin roughly every two weeks. That dust in your house, that's you uh, from your constantly uh, shedding your skin. But other cells uh, don't get replaced like that, and we can accumulate mutations until they become uh, cancerous. Uh, we have a number of new approaches uh, from the druggable target bits, but with these neoantigens, uh, we can take a number of different approaches. Uh, one with an HPV-16 caused a tumor in a patient that's been completely unresponsive to any of uh, the chemotherapies. Uh, we actually isolated the T cells from the tumor and then made peptides from the neoantigens to select the T cell populations that would attack uh, the tumor by recognizing those neoantigens. We grew them up and as a population gave them back to the patient uh, and they've been pretty effective uh, at dramatically shrinking his tumor thus far. But for a longer term approach, we're developing RNA vaccines against these same neoantigens that we're testing both to see if they can create immune response uh, against the tumor in uh, combination with their other immune approaches, but even act as a pre preventative. For example, with prostate cancer, we see precancerous lesions with accumulated mutations that have not yet yielded a cancer cell. Uh, we should be able to make RNA vaccines at that stage, but it's early on and that's some of the speculation. Now, one of the things that was critical to us was not just to have genome sequence. Well, that's useful to, for some of the analyses I showed you. The only way that we see to interpret the genome is to have very large numbers of genomes, because all of us in the human population differ only about 3% from each other. But we need phenotype uh, and health data uh, for comparison. So at HLI, we started the health nucleus as a way to get uh, this phenotype uh, data and to try and change the practice of medicine 
from what it is currently of reactive. You get symptoms and you go see your physician. They try and work out what those symptoms are related to and come up with a treatment to a proactive, a preventative approach. And uh, uh, I'll show you some examples of this. Now, if you're between 50 and 74 in the US and you're a male, 30% of you will never reach the age of 74. If you're a female, 20% of you will never reach the age of 74. And hopefully these graphs show the main reasons why. Uh, in males, cancer is a little over a third of the cause, even slightly greater uh, in females. And cardiovascular disease uh, is approximately the other third. So with cancer and heart disease, if we could do early predictions, early detection, uh, it would change things quite dramatically. And the other third of diseases uh, we're also uh, looking at. We take a number of imaging approaches. This is a GE3T MRI uh, that we're using with some unique research protocols that aren't yet generally available. One of the advances in the last two years is this new restriction spectrum imaging that simply looks at the water molecule differences, for example, in tumor cells versus normal cells, or blood vessels versus surrounding tissues. And so without any contrast media in a short time in the MRI, we can get pretty stunning images. And we can diagnose cancer uh, without contrast media and without biopsy. So this was a study recently published by our key radiologist, David Caro at UCSD, uh, where the cancer shells show up in this bright uh, yellow images, basically a light where there's cancer. And when the prostates were removed, uh, the regions corresponded to exactly what the pathology showed. This is a radical difference from measuring PSA levels uh, and then getting random biopsies hoping to identify cancer. Uh, it's even more dramatic uh, with images like this. Uh, eight minutes in the MRI with no contrast, we can get a complete map of your brain vasculature. Uh, why is this important? Well, if your carotid arteries are getting uh, uh, blocked, or in a case like this, a young woman with a brain aneurysm, uh, we can detect things early on uh, when uh, they're totally preventable in terms of the outcomes. It turns out one in 50 in the human population have aneurysms, and they're usually detected by people uh, having sudden death, uh, or in the case of brain, they can have a severe stroke if it doesn't kill them. Just interventional radiology can simply put a coil in uh, and block that from being a problem. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned uh, uh, looking at, at the hippocampus and looking at disease. Uh, we now have algorithms developed by our colleagues at UCSD that give us quantitative data of 20 different brain uh, volume regions where we can detect changes in as little as three months. Now the hippocampus is this uh, yellow area in a normal brain. You can see it's quite large. We get the volume of that very precisely but you don't need that to see the tremendous difference here where the hippocampus is shrunk and there's just uh, open a volume in the area where the hippocampus was. Uh, it's pretty easy to diagnose uh, dementia uh, with that. All the people that come to the health nucleus think they're healthy and disease free. We're finding significant disease in about 40% of them. Uh, everything from uh, something like a cavernoma, which is a vascular a tumor in the brain. Here's another one, if you can see this uh, area at the top of the brain, it's another vascular type uh, tumor. Uh, you wouldn't want to be a football player uh, and get constantly hit on the head with that. Uh, it would certainly uh, a bleed. Here's a case where the, the new imaging techniques make a huge difference. This was a 56-year-old man who came in who was going through the health nucleus was going on a uh, world tour vacation uh, the next day, or so he thought. Uh, we discovered this five uh, centimeter uh, tumor uh, right under his breastbone. With the differential image, you can see on the right, 
uh, it showed up as a cancerous tumor, essentially lighting up uh, like a light bulb. Within a week, using the MRI image data, it was robotically uh, removed, and the tumor had just started to penetrate uh, the surrounding tissue. So it was a, we caught this at stage one. Uh, so it was an individual who thought he was healthy uh, for one week, knew he had cancer, uh, and is now cancer-free. Uh, had he waited until uh, this grew a little bit larger to cause symptoms, uh, he would have had uh, to go through some extensive chemotherapy and would probably have uh, about two years to live. So that's a pragmatic difference in longevity. And this is very different than what we get from all the tumors in our comprehensive cancer program where they're usually diagnosed at stage four. For example, right now, we have three women in their 30s with stage four uh, colon cancer. It's so much more satisfying when we find these tumors at stage zero or stage one. We can also diagnose metabolic disease right in the MRI because you can quantitatively measure the amount of liver fat. Uh, normal is uh, 4% or less. And we're finding people with up to 38% liver fat uh, uh, that will uh, certainly uh, have uh, liver transplants uh, in their future. Uh, being completely unaware of this, this is uh, uh, a case of the non-alcohol related one uh, called uh, NASH uh, that can be diagnosed right off of these images. We have a little patch that we give uh, clients to wear. It's about the size of a Band-Aid. You wear it in your chest for two weeks and it records your EKG uh, 24 hours a day for two weeks. And we found now in five people life-saving data is three examples where people had episodic uh, AFib uh, for up to seven or eight hours a day being completely unaware of it. Uh, you probably know that's one of the major causes of stroke uh, from uh, coagulation in the uh, vibrating uh, atria. They were simply put on anticoagulant therapy we had two individuals uh, with complete heart block where their heart rate went down to 20 beats a minute um, and were somehow unaware of that. Part of the exciting discovery phase now is taking what we find from the clinical observations and matching those up with the genome. Uh, for example, polycystic kidney disease, we know the gene for that uh, and we can verify whether this is just a statistical probability or what rate we find these. Uh, we found a number of, uh, using 4D echo uh, cardiograms, uh, people with distended aortas, and we found a single gene duplication that seems to correlate with those. The last thing I want to tell you about is how we're applying machine learning to try and understand uh, new f features. Uh, you probably all uh, have used Google Translate at some time or another. Uh, we used it yesterday with our driver to communicate uh, between English and Japanese. Uh, Franz Auk is the guy who designed that at Google. Uh, I hired him to head up the team and the first challenge I gave him was to see if we could predict a photograph of your face uh, from your genome. But in your genome report that we give people, it's uh, over 500 pages now, we can accurately predict your genetic height, your BMI, your eye color, your skin color, your hair color, your hair texture, uh, and a photograph of you. We can also predict uh, your age. Uh, men and women, as we age, we lose sex chromosomes, we lose Y chromosomes if you're a male, and X chromosomes if you're a female. From our sequencing, we get a very accurate measurement of the telomere length, uh, and obviously that correlates with age, probably not in a causative fashion, uh, but it's a good measure. We can also measure mitochondrial sequence changes. So, we wanted to uh, try it uh, with face predictions, so we started a clinical trial. We recruited a, a thousand subjects and took 3D photographs of, of their face. We sequenced their genome and measured a number of other parameters. We're also trying to predict voice uh, from the genome. But from a digital voice recording, uh, we can tell uh, very accurately your age, your sex, and interestingly, your height which is an indication of your volume. That's just a digital recording you could even do over a telephone. 
Uh, with these images, uh, we built uh, algorithms with machine learning uh, that allow us uh, to uh, do some increasingly accurate predictions. Uh, these are photographs of uh, one woman uh, with a tremendous diversity in her ethnicity. Uh, the top is the 3D photos, and the uh, bottom is the straight computer predictions uh, just from the ACs, Gs, and Ts from her genetic code. Uh, 3D photographs aren't uh, very friendly uh, to people's uh, faces. Uh, so for the computer predictions, we go from the actual photograph, we actually smooth them. And the computer algorithm right now predicts your face with complete uh, symmetry. Uh, so people like their face predictions uh, because our, our prediction of beauty is based on that symmetry. And also we didn't know what age your genome would code for. It turns out it codes for just uh, post-puberty, so maybe age 16 to 18, uh, which we find interesting. Here's another one with the, uh, uh, on the far right, the computer predictions. These were with early versions. Uh, the latest version is getting uh, much better. This was the, uh, from the smooth photo, and this was the prediction straight from the genetic code. Uh, here's another example uh, on a male. And this is, you can see, without having the shape of the head or the ears, and we're not including the eye color and eye shape yet graphically in these. Uh, here's the computer prediction uh, right uh, from the genome. Ethnicity plays a big part in the calculation, so it's easy to get uh, people of different ethnogeographic uh, backgrounds. So these are starting to get more and more accurate. Uh, from your genome, aside from all the parameters I told you, we also get your blood type and a very accurate HLA type. So we get a lot of information uh, just straight from the code. Uh, if you go through the health nucleus, we put all this together. It's a lot of data, but we also take uh, 3D photos of uh, people's uh, whole body, and we make avatars, and uh, we give you all this data back on an iPad, and the avatar helps walk you through your data to explain some of this complexity. We're early on, we're trying to accumulate uh, at least a million records by 2020. Uh, we've done deals with pharmaceutical companies, including the latest with AstraZeneca, uh, to do a half million genomes over the next uh, eight to 10 years. Uh, with the phenotype data, this is gonna feed our machine uh, learning algorithms and give us a number of new exciting uh, predictions. So, Thank you very much.